I'm missing. All right. All right, so I'm ready to go. Yep, you are. All right, so while I'm pulling this stuff up, the number is 417-827-6275. And it's Don, oh, somebody's doing it right now. And it's Don Klepper, K-L-E-P-P-E-R. So today we're going to do the listing documents. All right, give me just a second, guys. She closed out on my stuff. And everybody, hopefully you guys can see all of this. If um, most of our forms are in the uh, transaction or in the uh, DocuSign, but if you can't find something and need a, a form that, or somebody sends you a strange form and you need to respond, this is how I actually find them. It's the easiest way to find the Missouri real estate forms. And it will bring you, whenever you see standard forms, click on that. And it will bring you right to this page, which will take you to your login. If you haven't logged in yet, you can create one. And then it brings you to all of the forms. So you can see every single one of them. Hey, are we supposed to be seeing your uh, Are screen? you not seeing over there, Jared? All right, hang on a second. I don't have it shared the right way then. Hang on just a second. Uh, you guys can see what I'm doing, but they can't. I don't know why I can't find this. There it is. There's what I need. I don't know why I closed out of you guys there. All right, so all you guys, can you guys even see me, Jared? Yeah, I can see you, but the other screen that it's sharing is this, uh, the Zoom screen. It's just on that Zoom. Just on page. the Zoom screen. All right, I'm not finding what I need here. This is why I have someone else do this stuff for me. Gotta love the good technology. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, and of course, Nicole's left me now, so. Uh... I don't know why it's not giving me the whole page here. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm just going to text right now, Are you? Okay, thank you. I don't know how I lost the page with you guys on it. Just close out of everything. We'll just try again here. You see this scheduling made easy. Is that the page that you're seeing right now? Yes, I can see that. Let's just go at it this way then. Okay. Yeah, I was gonna say I would follow you on my computer, but I forgot I can't even view the documents yet. All right, so can you see now that I've got standard forms? Yes, yes, sir. All right, excellent. We'll just use this page then. I did something and moved you guys out of the other one. So we'll use this one. We got it. Awesome. All right, when you come to your Forms R Us and then you can sign in. And it will bring you and you guys can get all the forms that way. So this is where I normally come in. Um, this one I'm teaching just because it's easier for me to find it. But you can get most of these things in actually DocuSign. <clears throat> all right, now that we got everybody up and running. Today we're gonna to do seller documents. So let's see if I can turn the brightness up on the screen a little bit because I'm old and can't see. So first things first, we need to get our seller under an employment agreement. Um, and that looks like this. Put you guys down there so we can all see. Okay, so we've got uh, we got a seller that's ready to sell and we need to get them under an employment agreement. Something you guys should know is you can put anyone in your database under an employment agreement, whether it's buyer or seller right now. They don't have to be ready to do it, but they can go ahead and employ you at any point. So it's not a matter of 
I don't want you waiting any longer than you have to to get these signed because if you don't sign with them and I meet them tomorrow and they sign with me, you guys are out of the deal. So don't don't be shy about going ahead and getting them to hire you right out of the gate. Seller's name goes here in the first blank. Uh, the owner's going to hire this Keller Williams. We'll go in this blank. And hopefully, I'm about to have a conversation with DocuSign in the next week or two, where we, hopefully we can get some of this stuff auto-populated for you guys. So it, it will hopefully already say Keller Williams in that blank, but currently it doesn't. So obviously, street address, city, zip, and county. You can check this box if you want to attach the legal description. I encourage you not to do that because it defaults to the title company. If not, and I would rather it be on the title company's shoulders than on yours, because that way if there's an error, it's on them. It's on you guys. So I would tell you just leave that box blank and, and let the title company figure that out with the vesting deed. Okay. And uh, the address is the seller's address, right? Correct. The, the property address that you are going to sell is this address right here. Okay. And then when your seller signs this document back here on this page, they're going to print their name. And this date right here is the effective date that this contract begins. So if your seller were to sign that today, obviously the contract date would be one six or seven, whatever today is, one seven, 2021. This date on page one is actually the date that this agreement expires. So if you had a six month contract or a six month listing period, this would be whatever, June 6th, 2021 would be what this date is in here. Okay. Do you guys have a criteria for the, the length of time of contracts here? Not, at Keller not Williams? really. Uh, the question is, do we have a, uh, is there a specific time frame that we should do? I prefer to get it longer than shorter. My hope is that I'm going to sell your property in the next week or two or month or whatever, but rather than us having to go back and amend and re-sign this paperwork, let's go ahead and do a six month or a year. To me, six months should be enough on a listing because if you can't get it sold in six months, then you're probably not doing something right or they don't have it priced right. On a buyer's agency, I just try to get those for a year because I don't see any reason not to um, because I'm also going to let anyone out of a contract. If they decide they don't want to work with me, I'm not going to hold them hostage. I'm going to let them out. So, And I tell them not going into it. So I would just tell you, you know, whatever you and your seller can agree to as far as the date goes, but I would make it at least six months because, again, if it doesn't sell for whatever reason, then you don't have to go back and amend this you know, in a month from now to make sure that you are still technically under employment and allowed to, and re, um, re, uh, still allowed to get paid. Because if once this expires, you're not supposed to get paid. Because this, they are hiring Keller Williams, the brokerage right here. And if this date passes, then we are no longer their brokerage. And technically they don't have to pay us. So. This listing amount right here is whatever you and the sellers agree to at the time of this meeting. So if you meet with your seller today and we're gonna list it tomorrow on Friday, obviously, and you meet with your sellers today and you're trying to get them to price it at 99.9 and they are stuck at 105, that's great. But 105 in this blank right here today and go on about your business and continue with the contract. Now, your seller calls you in the morning and says, you know what, you're right, let's do it at 99.9 because I wanna get it moved. Don't worry about coming back and amending this. Don't worry about changing it. This is what you guys agreed to at the time that you were meeting. So it's fine. I don't, I'm not concerned about you coming back and changing that for compliance or anything like that. If there's any specific terms, are we offering a you know, selling bonus if we close it in, in the next 30 days? Um, is there, you know, seller can't move out until X date? What if there's any restrictions or extra things, you can fill that in there. Normally, you won't have anything in that blank. Owner acknowledges that we're going to do everything we can with our advertising, our co-brokers and everything to earn our fees. And if we do find somebody, if we find a ready, willing and able buyer that the seller is going to pay X amount. Now you will hear me over and over again if you attend my classes tell you I don't want to price fix you because I legally can't do that. But I'm going to use nice round numbers that you will see almost regularly. So if you are dealing with the seller, keep in mind that you have to pay both your commission as the selling agent, and you also have to pay the commission of the buyer's agent. So this amount right here needs to reflect both of those amounts together. So in this particular case, we're gonna do six. Now, it also says indicate percent of sales price or specific dollar amount. I don't think anyone in a reasonable mind is gonna think that you were selling this house for $6, but I don't want you to risk that. So make sure that you get your percentage mark in after that six on that. Now you've got a protection period I and mean, this is what it explains down here. And what it says is if my client, I had a listing with this client and expired on December 31st, 
and my client has not hired anyone else to represent their property. And a buyer or a buyer's agent or whatever, a buyer that saw this property while I had it listed has made an offer and the seller sells the house. I am still entitled to my commission. Now, my agreement expires on December 31st and they go hire Brian on January 1st, I'm out of the deal. I don't get any money. So the protection period is essentially if your client doesn't hire someone else and sells it to someone that has seen it underneath your employment, you're entitled to your commission. Now, this is another one that people say, well, what's the right amount of time to do? I personally do 90 days, three months, because I don't feel like after that period, I can necessarily with a good conscience say that I'm still the reason that that person is buying that house. Now, that being said, I know that the three top teams in the office do 180 days. So they're getting the full six months out of them. So that's truly whatever you want to do. And I, and I make that on you guys, not necessarily on your clients. That's just, you set your protection period and you decide what that time period is and just tell them, well, this, if you don't hire somebody else, I'm still entitled to my commission, okay? And then all this talks about, <clears throat> just what I said, that if they hire somebody else that you're out. So here we have the general commission amount that we're going to get. If you are charging a transaction fee to your clients, $150, $250 for every transaction, that's where that number goes. Um, and not ever, I don't, I've been, I don't, I haven't charged one in 20 years. I know some people that charge them right out of the gate. It's just a matter of how you want to process your paperwork. You can collect that either as of the date of this contract or the date of closing. I would encourage you if you are collecting one to do it the date of closing, because the check has to be made out to Keller Williams. We don't have an escrow account. I'm not going to require the office to hold those checks for you because we don't have a place to hold them. And I'm not going to require them to just issue a $250 check every time somebody gets a listing. So those won't be processed until closing anyway. So to me, you may as well just collect it at closing. And if you don't have, if you don't collect one, then put a zero in this blank and check the not applicable button. <clears throat> All right, up here on line 18, we determined with the seller the total amount of commission the seller was going to pay. Down here in this section, we are going to indicate how we are going to delineate that amount to other agents. Typically what you will see is this, because you're gonna most often split that again, not to price fix you, but split that 6% in half and you're gonna give everybody 3%. I personally don't pay transaction brokers that much because I don't think they do their job, so they don't. Um, so that's just, it's, again, that is whatever you decide to pay. Because another example would be if you talked your seller into a, you know, 7% commission, good for you, then these numbers would be, you know, maybe three and a half, or they may be four. Because keep in mind, is, the more you offer out to other agents, the faster they're going to come look at your house. If I've got two houses that are identical, I'm certainly going to go show the one at three and a half percent before I'm going to show the one at three. I got to feed my family too. So I'm going to show that one and perhaps push that one a little bit harder. So um, I have a this is typically question what here. you guys will see in those blanks here. Um, something to note, if you do decide to charge different amounts to different people, as far as what they're doing in the MLS, and I'll point this out when we go do the entry in a little bit. In the MLS, it goes buyer's agent, sub-agent, transaction broker. On this contract, it goes sub-agent, buyer's agent, transit. So the sub-agent and the buyer's agent are flipped on this contract versus the way you see them on the MLS. So if you do charge a different amount or pay a different amount, just make sure you're paying attention to which one you're filling in there. When we have signed up with the board, we have all signed a cooperation agreement that states we're going to put out our, the amount of commission we're gonna pay on the MLS to other agents. And when they choose to, to do that, we're gonna pay them because they're part of our board. This box at 48 allows you to exclude people that are not part of our board of realtors. I don't know why you would do this because to me, if you've got a ready, willing and able buyer, I don't care if you're part of my board or not. I wanna sell my client's house, but this allows you not to pay those people if they're not part of our board. Again, I don't know why you would because I'm certainly not gonna sell, sell the house if I know I'm not gonna get paid for it. So <clears throat> I don't know why you would necessarily exclude anyone. 49 and 50, you can exclude anyone or any brokerage from this property. 
So cousin Eddie has always been the black sheep of the family and we don't like him and we don't want to sell the house to him. So we're going to make sure that cousin Eddie doesn't buy the house. That's great. As long as we're not excluding cousin Eddie because of one of the seven or eight protected classes. If we're, if we're not selling the house to cousin Eddie because he's black, then that won't work. If we're not selling it to cousin Eddie because he's just a real pain in the butt, that's fine. It doesn't matter. Same thing with, a, you know, if we've got, if the client has had a bad experience with ABC Realty, you can exclude ABC Realty from showing that property. Um, now, it gets hairy because ABC Realty will ultimately call me and say, why can't I show this property? Well, the client requested that you were not allowed. So you can do that. I don't think you will run into using 49 and 50 a whole lot, if ever. Uh, but that's what they're there for if you need to exclude anyone from purchasing the property. Motivating factors. Do we want to disclose why this um, client is moving? If you check does, you must put something in this blank or compliance will kick it back. If you don't want your client's information out, you can just check does not and then leave this blank. 54 and 55. I really want you guys, if at all possible, to get does checked in both of these boxes. Because what this does, it gives you a little bit of freedom. 54 states that I am allowed to tell other prospective agents that I already have an offer on the property. That seems pretty straightforward and pretty clear. 55 says I can actually discuss the terms of those offers if need be. Now, and I want you to be really careful with this because I don't want you guys using this maliciously, you know, to try to uh, you know, up the sales price of somebody else. But at the same rate, if you're going to send me a hundred thousand dollar offer with an FHA loan and $2,500 in closing costs, I would like to be able to tell you, I've already got 100,000 cash on the table. If you want to beat that, great. If you don't, that's fine. But my client is certainly going to go with 100 cash, no closing costs versus your 100 with closing costs. It makes sense? So that's the way I explain it to my clients is I'm not necessarily going to utilize this, but I want to have the ability so I don't have to call you and ask you permission later. Because that way, if I've got an agent that's going to send us a contract that's just going to waste our time, I'd rather just tell them not to send it. Does that make sense? Great. And then you move forward with them. So I, I would like you to have does checked on both those if you can. All right. Most often, your client is not going to be working with someone else. You can check is, is not and move right on down the road. Now, if this client called you and said, hey, Don's really not doing a good job for me. Um, when his listing expires, will you take it over? You can say yes, absolutely. And you can go have a conversation with them that day. And if that is the case, you're going to check is because they are under an agreement. And what we're going to do is we have to determine the date that my agreement would expire. So if my agreement expires on 1 31 2021, I'm just going to bring you back and show you this at the same time here. You will only use section 19 in this particular example because I, I stated earlier that this is typically the date that your contract becomes effective. We have already stated that this client is under another contract with me until the end of January. So yours cannot become effective until mine expires. So your effective date is going to be in this particular instance, the 2-1-2021. And that's the only reason I want you to use that blank at 19 even if your seller says, well, we're not going to be re ready to sell until February 1st. So let's just make the effective date February 1st. I don't want you to do that. I want your effective date to be today. A, because I can start working for you. I can start talking to my other agents about your property. I can come over and I can advise you about things that you want to do. And secondly, and more importantly for you guys, is if you have this effective date of 2-1-2021 because the seller wanted to wash the, you know, wash the walls and clean the carpets or whatever, and I meet this client on January 31st and we have a great conversation and I get an employment agreement that's dated January 31st, guess what? I win. So the only reason to postpone this close date or this active date to me is if they are already under a contract or a listing agreement with someone else. And then I truly don't think that you're going to encounter that a whole lot if perhaps ever but if they are under agreement that's how you utilize and allows you to go ahead and have conversations with them property disclosures if you list a property you must have a seller's disclosure as part of our eno policy coverage so if your seller says well i'm not filling out disclosures they at least have to fill out the four mandatory on the first page <clears throat> they don't have to fill out the rest of the document but we have to have a disclosure attached to every listing 
to have our um, E&O coverage taken care of. And this also states that the seller is going to tell us of anything that comes up with the property during the listing period that they think we should know. So if the furnace goes out and they have to have it replaced, we're gonna to need to disclose that information. Notice of intended sale. We're gonna make sure that anybody that's doing repairs, perhaps installing that new furnace, that those receipts are getting to the title company to be paid at closing or that the seller has already paid them because we do not wanna saddle the new buyer with a lien on the property because a bill wasn't paid. So that's what the notice of intended sale is about. If the property is after 1978, you're exempt from the lead-based paint. If you're 78 or before, you need to attach a lead-based paint. In addition to the disclosures that the seller has made, they are also indicating that they don't know of any other subdivision, homeowner association, or condos, no other adverse material effects which may affect the property, and to their knowledge, everything's gonna be working at the time of closing. And I think that third one is kind of important because if you know that if the seller says, well, the stove's not working and I'm not gonna fix it, I want you to make a note of that in this particular agreement because they are signing this agreement stating that everything's gonna be working. So if you know that it's not gonna be working, just make a note of it. So everybody's on the same page. Um, owner represents that they are not a foreign person or are. When in doubt, you can go to the site, but if it's a citizen or resident alien, then it is not. Uh, and that's most often what you're gonna run into. Owner's gonna hold us harmless if there's any lawsuits or litigation that comes out of them withholding information from us. So if your client knows that behind that beautiful bookcase, there is a giant crack in the foundation and they don't disclose that to us and it becomes an issue with the new buyer later, we are not liable for that because we did not know that information. And this kind of goes back to anything you guys know, you've got to disclose, period, end of sentence. Um, where hang on i want to make sure yep i, want to, don't, I don't want to miss this right here um it's coming back up to our property disclosures if we have a property that got an offer on it the buyers went through their inspections and we couldn't come to terms on repairs so the deal died we have in our possession or the seller has in their possession an inspection report and or perhaps specialist reports as a result of that previous buyer it indicates here at line 73 and 74, owner further agrees to promptly furnish realtor with all inspection reports regarding the property and authorizes them to disclose and provide such reports to prospects. I don't want you attaching that inspection report to your MLS, but if I send you an offer and we negotiate and we're, we have a contract, I expect you to send that to me immediately because A, you've already been given authorization by the seller and B, more importantly, you as the agent, know about that report so you know things about that property that you are required by law to disclose and the easiest way to do that is just send me the report make sense so just keep in mind that you are when in doubt you are uh, or if you're ever doubted whether you can or not you are allowed to send that information on if you have a deal that falls through so again they're going to hold us harmless about anything that they kept from us that comes out of um, you know, if they admitted anything or lied about something and litigation comes out of that, we are free and clear on that. Title and survey seller says they're going to provide a clean title as of the time of um, closing. And if they have a survey, they're going to provide that to the buyer. So if your seller has already done a survey, they're agreeing that they're going to go ahead and give that to the buyer. Taxes and assessments will be prorated based on the time of closing. So if we're closing on June 31st, the buyer's going to pay for six months and the seller's going to pay for six months. Okay. Earnest money liquidated damages. Much like the protection period, um, I don't want you going and opening a brand new bank account for all of the earnest money money that you're going to make. Much like protection period money, you're not going to make a whole lot of that. But this indicates that if we have a deal that falls through and there's earnest money and it's not disputed and the seller keeps the earnest money, Seller pays for any real expenses that they've had first, and then we get to pay for any expenses that we've had, such as if we've uh, paid to uncover the septic lid, or I don't know what other things there might be. This is not your gas, this is not your meals, but if you've had a real expense, then you're entitled to that. And then once those expenses are paid, if there's still money left over, then we split it 50-50 with the seller. 
So like I said, don't go open a new bank account for that because most often the seller is going to eat up whatever that is with their expenses right out of the gate. Okay. Seller is agreeing that they are going to, uh, that they know that we're going to put all of our, all their information on the MLS. And if they want us to withhold anything, they need to let us know that we're going to cooperate and pay other brokers, just as we indicated back here on page one with the, with the commission amount that they are giving us. <clears throat> and then we're going to put a lockbox on the property and the owner's going to be okay with all that and hold us not liable for anything provided that we were not um, that we were diligent with ourselves about those things. So we're not revealing too much information on the MLS that might provide issues for the client. And we're making sure that lockbox is either locked to something or at least hidden and not just sitting out on the front porch for anyone to come take it. And if you don't have one that's not attached to a doorknob or a you know, awning or whatever, make sure your clients know where it's supposed to be. And after every showing, call your clients and make sure it's back where it's supposed to be. That way, if something happens, they know that you have taken the effort to make sure that lockbox is where it's supposed to be. And if something happens, then that eliminates some of our liability. Owners authorizing us to do any and all the advertising that you guys want. If they want to um, withhold or don't want you to advertise somewhere, they can tell us that and we can put that in the special agreements later on in the contract. But they're allowing you to do everything that you, that you can do. Owners gonna allow us and our cooperating brokers to come through the property as well as lenders, appraisers, inspectors, provided we give them um, advanced notice. And Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I'm gonna come in or I'm gonna have my photographer come in and we're gonna take pictures of this property. And these pictures are gonna be on my MLS, which is broadcast out to about 700 different sites. So your, your house is gonna be everywhere on the internet. So if you don't want it seen, put it away. Same thing when they later on in the paragraph at 154, Owner agrees to remove and secure all property and valuables um, and to ensure them if need be. If you don't want it seen on the MLS, put it away. If you don't want it taken, when people are looking at your house, put it away. Okay? So this is a, I really like to kind of pause at this particular, actually these next two paragraphs, seven and eight, just to tell my seller that you've got some responsibility in this as well. So make sure that you are being diligent about your things. If you're used to throwing your keys and your $20 bill in that basket on the counter in the kitchen, we need to change that pattern. We need to change that habit because you're gonna come home one day and that 20 is gonna be gone and you're gonna be mad about it. So make sure that they're being diligent about that. <clears throat> Contract allows by default four days. Um, well, A, the owner's gonna have the utilities turned on during inspection and walkthroughs. And if the property's vacant, the buyer has the right to have the utilities transferred to their name up to four days ahead of time and the seller. So the main thing is the seller doesn't have to do this. The buyer doesn't have to do this. If they agree to do it, great. I think it's really kind of a nonsense line in the contract because if my buyer wants to move in early or whatever, we're gonna already have that conversation. But you got four days by default that you can have the utilities transferred. And I, I think it's no need to mess with that blank, just leave it like it is. Recordings on property. This is becoming more and more prevalent because we've got people with the doorbells and the cameras and all of that stuff. That's great. Mr. And Mrs. Seller, two things. Number one, please don't listen when people are in the house. I can guarantee you it's just going to piss you off because somebody's going to say something about your house that's going to make you mad. So don't listen to it. And number two, if you do listen to it, I don't want to know about it. Because if any litigation arises out of you listening or watching the recording while the people are there, it's not my deal. That's on you. And that's what paragraph eight says is if you utilize those things and litigation comes out of that, I've already warned you, I'm not part of that. That's on you. So just try to encourage your folks. And I try to put them in the, on the other side of the table too, saying, if we, when we go look at houses, do you want people listening in on what we're saying? And most often they're going to say no. And then you say, okay, that's why we're not going to do that when people are in your house. Warranty program, either we're gonna offer one or not, or we will consider at a later date. I would really like you guys, hopefully, to offer a warranty plan on every one. And the script I use for this is real easy, is it's 500 bucks, it's gonna make your property show better, and if the deal truly comes down to $500, we can negotiate it out if we have to. But your property will show better, and it will present better with the warranty already attached. So I like to get them, I, I truly put them on every listing unless they just really fight about it with that very script. If 
if $500 comes down to it, we'll either I'll work it out or we'll negotiate it out. And if they don't want to do that, I would really like you to come over and at least consider at a later date because this not offer a warranty plan is already, it's going to put a stop in their, in their brain already. So if I get an offer that's requesting a home warranty and they've already signed this, I'm not offering one. I've already got a stop that I got to get past versus, well, you said you would consider it at a later date. Now we need to consider it because it's part of their offer. Okay. So hopefully you get one on everyone, but if not, hopefully you can at least consider it at a later date. Legal and professional advice. I am a realtor by trade. I am not a law, tax, finance, survey, structural, mechanical, hazmat, or anything else. I am a realtor. I can answer all the questions you want to know about this house, but if you want to start talking about taxes and surveys and all those things, that's not me. If you don't have that person, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, I am happy to help you find those people, but I am not those people and I'm not going to answer those kinds of questions. Okay. Yeah. I know we're going to have a great transaction and we're never going to yell at each other or be mad because every seller and every agent always get along so well. Blah, blah, blah. But if I have to sue you because of default to get my commission, you're also going to pay for my attorney fees. Yep. Franchise disclosure, check that box because we are part of a franchise. So if your seller does get mad at you, they can only sue this office. They can't sue the whole franchise. Equal opportunity, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, I'm gonna show this property to everyone. If you wanna exclude anyone other than cousin Eddie because he's just a pain in the butt, um, then you need to find someone else to list your property because I cannot forbid any of these people coming in your house, nor really can you. So if you've got anybody that's hard, that, hard set on that, go somewhere else. When you enter into this agreement, you are a seller's limited agent. You are working specifically for that seller with the seller's best interest at heart above all others. I mentioned earlier that when your client signs this document, they are hiring Keller Williams. And then we, Keller Williams, are gonna come designate you as the agent to work with this particular client. So any licensed person other than Jim or myself that will be talking to this client about this property needs to be on this list. So if you're a solo agent, it would just be your name. If you're working in tandem with someone, you would put both your names. If you're on a team, every licensed member of that team should be on these blanks because it's virtually impossible for large teams to have meetings and information about my client not cross the table to people on the other side, okay? And then, either, like I said, either Jim or I will sign this, and this hopefully will be done as well as I talked about the auto-populate. I'm hoping we can get our signature already put here, and then all you guys got to do is fill in the date. Okay. As I stated, you are a seller's limited agent when you enter into this transaction. I want you to have yes checked on both of these. And this is much like the terms and offers on page one. I want you to have permission to do this. And what this says is, Mr. Seller, um, if by chance I happen to find a buyer that has needs that your house beats perfectly, I want to have the ability to represent that buyer as well as represent you. And it's at this point, I actually bring the client down to these last two pages. I go over the stool agency right here because it states very specifically what I can and can't do. I can't tell that the buyer is willing to pay more, seller willing to take less, what the motivating factors are of either party, um, if the client will consider other financing terms or any offers we've had previously. And the way I like to describe it is, um, picture us at a ping pong table, you're the seller on one side, the buyer's on the other, but instead of that little net, there's a giant concrete wall. And I can't take anything from your side of the table to the other side of the table without your permission. If you give me permission, I can take that information across, but I cannot give any information about you or the buyer to the other party because I can't get through that wall unless somebody gives me specific permission to do so, okay? Uh, again, I just like bringing them down to that point because it, it makes it a lot clear about what it is. And the other thing I, I tell them is I'm not a dual agent until I am one. I am working entirely for you until such point that a buyer comes along that this house meets perfectly. And then at that point, I will be a dual agent. Conversion to transaction brokerage. You will also learn if you attend my classes how much I hate transaction brokerage. Because transaction broker is truly a paper pusher. You can't advise, you can't consult, you can't direct. 
You can't give any really any opinions. What you can do is you can fill in the blanks. How much do you want to offer on this house? How much do you want to counter? And I, but I can't tell you what I think about it. I can't send you a CMA because I'm truly just a paper pusher. And when we enter into this contract, we are a seller's limited agent working for them, advising them, consulting them. So I see it as nearly impossible to be able to convert back to a transaction broker at that point, because you've already engaged in this relationship and now I'm supposed to come back and not tell you or do anything. You will have a client or clients eventually that will want this kind of service. And when that happens, just let me know and we'll talk through it because you truly have to be careful about that because if you give them any opinion and they have any problems, it can come back and really bite you. So typically what I just want you guys to do is just check no on these because I don't think we can convert back to transaction brokerage. And if we need to, then we'll have that conversation and um, go, forward, go forward from there. Minimum brokerage services. This is just what the statute says that we're going to do. Accept and deliver offers assist the owner in developing and communicating those offers and answer any questions about those offers. Again, we're gonna do so much more than this, but this is what the statute stipulates that we're going to do. If you are a part of this transaction in any way, shape or form, whether you're buying it, whether you have ownership interest in it, or whether you're showing this to an immediate family member, immediate family member or parents, siblings and children. Personally, I go ahead and tell, tell us when it's aunts and uncles and cousins, because I see no reason not to. And I don't want that to be an issue later on down the road when they find out that, oh, that's your cousin. I didn't know. It's not a big deal. So why not go ahead and disclose it? Special agreements, anything that we need um, that's not in the language up here. And I also <clears throat> will tell you, I don't ever really want you guys to have to use your client's words against them. But at the same rate, it's good to take notes. So if you've got a client that says, um, you know, due to the kids' schedules, we can only have the house shown Tuesday night and Thursday night from five to eight. I'm going to make a note of that right here. Only showing, well, I'm not going to type it out, but I'm going to make a note of that right here because that way when that client calls me in three weeks and says, why haven't we had an offer yet? I mean, this market's really hot and I'm not having offers. Well, because you specifically told me that we could only have showings on Tuesday and Thursday night from five to eight, and that's really hindering our ability to sell your property or um, you know, day sleeper, I need a two hour lead time for the dog, whatever those uh, stipulations are, make a note of them. One, so you don't forget them. And two, hopefully you don't have to use your client's words back at them. But if you do, they've signed off and agreed to what they, what they said. So I like doing that. Signatures, thanks to this wonderful thing called the Missouri Uniform Electronic Transaction Act. You can be in Seattle, Washington. Your client can be in Miami, Florida. And you guys can still sign this contract and it's still valid in the state of Missouri. This contract is only valid in our state. And because of the Missouri Uniform Electronic Transactions Act, we can sign it from anywhere in the world and it's still valid in the state. I do want you to check this box right here because what that box at 270 says that if you have an email that comes from this email address from your client to your email address here, that says, um, let's reduce the price from 99.9 to 95. You can do that based on that email. Now, currently compliance will still require you to have a data sheet addendum from the MLS. In my conversations upcoming with them, I'm going to let them know that as long as the box is checked at 270, that all you guys need to do is just upload a copy of that email into your file in lieu of the data sheet addendum, okay? But currently you're still gonna have to have that data sheet addendum. But what I like about this box right now is I can be on the road headed out of town and my client can call me at 7.30 in the morning. I can pull over, I can make that change to the MLS because this gives me authorization to do so provided they send me an email. And then I can worry about getting the signature on the paperwork later. I can get that reduction in right now and get it done, okay? And it just makes, your, makes things a lot easier. And same thing here, anybody that's going to be uh, if you're on a team and perhaps your admin is going to be handling the paperwork, make sure that their email address and stuff is here because it can come from any of these email addresses to any of these over here. And if you need more, you can just add another one down here. Keller Williams goes here. Again, hopefully it will be populated for you soon. I need your name or your signature, your name and your date. Obviously we wanna do the email address so we can get this transaction from here. I don't care what your title is. 
Call yourselves superstar for all I care. Question? I would, yeah, I would absolutely put your, your, your admins on there because that way they can receive that email and they can make the change and you guys don't have to do a thing. Okay. Um, so yeah, I don't care what your title is. Owner's address, obviously, most likely it's going to be on page one because it's the property that we're selling. If it is different, I do like to get it here just because it, it's a quick place for me to go find it. Last two pages of this are just what our duties are. And I'm not going to bore you guys going over this, but if they want to know what it means to be a seller's limited agent, here they are right here. Again, we've already brought them back most likely to this dual agency and talked about this. And then the last page is transaction broker, which I would just like to throw away. All right, questions about the contract, either here or online, anyone? Yeah, I just have a quick question. A transaction broker, is it more or less like a like an assistant because they're not able to do anything real estate related that requires a license? You can, the question is, is a transaction broker more like an assistant? Um, it is truly somebody, the, the best example I can give you of that is I've got a seller that called me and said, hey, cousin, cousin Eddie wants to buy my property. Will you do the paperwork for me? To me, that's the really only time that you would be a transaction broker because they've already made the agreement about all of their terms. You're just going to be the knowledgeable one that puts those terms in the right spots on the contract. Um, you can still do anything. It's just a matter of you're not supposed to advise or consult. And I just think that's really difficult to do um, in general because you know we want to help people and it's hard for us not to tell them what, what we think. And as soon as you've done that, you violated the transaction brokerage. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Um, do we need lead paying disclosure if, even if um, the home is completely remodeled? All right, say that again. My volume was way down. Say that again. Do we need lead paying disclosure if the home is completely remodeled? Do we need She's saying, do you need a uh, paint disclosure if the house is remodeled? Do we need a disclosure if the house is remodeled? Yeah, I mean, you're going to have to fill out disclosures either way, um, whether it's new or remodeled or not. So, yeah, you've got to have disclosures across the board. I mean, the lead, lead paint. The leak? Lead. The, the lead paint. She's talking about the lead paint. It's for the houses that are... Uh, Older than 1978. 1978 and before yes. for lead-based paint. Mm -hmm. If it was built after that, there's no, they stopped making lead and paint as, as of 78. So if it's after 78, there won't be any issues. If it's prior to 78, then you've got to put that disclosure in there to indicate whether or not you know there's lead-based paint. And I'll show you that disclosure here in just a second. All right. Uh, didn't bring me where I wanted to go. Okay. Um, I don't know why that didn't take me to the main page that I wanted. But so we've got our sell, we signed our agreement, and now we need to enter a listing. Okay. Well, we're going to come to the cleverly named ad listing. I really want my. tax data too. I don't know why I didn't get that. All right. Well, I can't find what I'm wanting right now, unfortunately. I don't know why it's not taking me to the main page. Anyway, so when you go to the main page of Flex, which for whatever reason I can't get to at the moment, you have two different tax platforms. You have CRS and you have RPR. They're both really good. CRS is what MLS pulls from and puts information into your document for you. So we got a residential for sale. Your listing information is going to automatically pop here. If you're listing it with someone else, you can you know, put them in here and it will pull up whoever you need to do and you can add them to your listing. Parent or child listing. Most often it's going to be a parent listing and not a child. 
or regular listing. But what parent and child does, there's two different ways we can go about it. One is I've got a property with 50 acres and my client will sell the property and the 50 acres. My client will sell the property in 10 acres. My client will sell 40 acres. My client will sell 30 acres. So the parent listing is gonna be house and 50 acres. And then I'm gonna have all these quote children hanging off the side. So if someone is, is looking at my listing with the 50 acres, they will also be automatically linked to be able to see that I would sell it with 10 acres or with 20. And if they happen to find my 20 listing or 20 acre listing, it's gonna bring them back to the parent and so they can see, so it just links all of them together. The other example, this would be if you had a client that had multiple properties that they wanted to move all at once, the best exposure you can get is to make parent and children because then you can get, put your best, pro, put your best foot forward on the parent listing and then hook all the children to it. So that way, anytime somebody looks at house 25, it brings them back to house one and shows them that there's 26 others they could buy at the same time, okay? Most often you won't run into that, but that's, that's how you utilize those if you need to. If it is in pink, it must be filled in. And because I can't pull up the tax records, normally I will have CRS open in the background. Um, so I can go and copy and paste like the tax ID number. I should be able to get a pull up without that though. I'm gonna click that populate button and then it's gonna bring up options for me. Which one of these do I want? I'm gonna hit this auto populate and it's gonna bring in certain information into the listing for me already. Now, I will tell you that information isn't necessarily always correct. So make sure you're paying attention to it. And that's a lot of times what I utilize RPR for. I really like RPR when I'm working with a buyer because it gives so much information about the area and the neighborhoods and the demographics that your buyer could really benefit from. But the, there's just so much information. I try to just use CRS when I'm doing my um, entries. But when in doubt, you've got another one that you can go compare to. So this particular property that I use in my example all the time, um, I used to live in, and I know that the tax data is not right because the, uh, for the square footage, which I wish I could show to you guys, and the RPR is a different number as well. So it's one of those, if you have that much discrepancy, it's a clear sign to say, um, you know, buyers to do their own due diligence on square footage to make sure that you're, they, they are aware of the fact that the square footage may or may not be correct. Now it's gonna want me to make sure I know where the property is. So if you know this property is actually up here, just drag the pen, because this is what is gonna show when the public goes and does the mapping of the property, it's gonna pull it up for them. At any point in time, you can come over here and click this save and complete button after you get the first two pages done. <laughs> and I'm gonna show my age here in just a second because I like to come over here and I like to print this input form. And the reason I do that, anything that I have already filled out, like any of the pink areas that I filled out is already gonna be populated. So you can see that our address and our tax ID have already been filled out. But I like actually printing a hard copy of this and taking it with me to the listing because then as I'm walking through the house, I can say, oh, there's a fireplace right there in the, in the basement. And I can go ahead and check that on my, on my piece of paper so I don't have to remember it when I get back to the office. Now, I'm sure that this can be done on an iPad, but I, that's far too, for me. I would rather just have a paper copy and same like the flooring and the, the wall coverings and those things, exterior features. I actually have the document right there in front of me. And at any point I can reference that and just go back. So I like to do that um, just as a general practice, but you can come back in here at any point and edit and amend this. We've already done our address. Now we're going down to main fields. And I'm gonna do, as I go through this, a lot of the stuff won't be accurate just because I'm trying to get through it so you guys can see it. Um, is it a vacation rental? Yes or no? Be really careful on this if someone says, oh yeah, we've been using it as an Airbnb for three years. Make sure they have permission to do that. Because there are rules in, the, in Greene County, there are rules down in Branson where a lot of people are doing them. So just make sure they actually have permission to do that because I don't want you guys advertising it 
and someone buying it under the, the assumption they can do an Airbnb only to find out they can't, okay? Begin date and end date, you probably won't know these until you meet with the client, but we'll assume that we're gonna to start today and then you can come down here and I'm just gonna, we're just gonna have a full year, full year run of that one. Whatever your list price is, obviously you're gonna fill that up. Oh, numbers locked off again. List price, MLS, if this is a parent or child, you can do some more things here. If it's in a historical district, go ahead and indicate that and you can put status unknown if you don't know what the status of it is. Because some people will specifically buy properties because it's in historical district because they can get the tax credits. So if you know that it's in one, even if you don't know the status of it, just go ahead and put it in there. Foreclosure short sale, those are obviously two different classes that are, I think there's one in Ignite. And I'll be, I'm hoping to do one here for fairly soon, but if you run into that, let's talk before you just go and peek first on that. Are there any reserve items? Does the client wanna keep that chandelier in the front room? If so, go ahead and put the reserve. I try not to put reserve items if I can keep from it. If they really want that chandelier, I'm gonna encourage them to go ahead and take it down and let's put another light fixture in its place because that is something when somebody walks into the house, that's the first thing they see and we're already doing a takeaway of them before they've even looked at the rest of the house. So anything that the client wants to keep, I try to get them to remove it before we start listing. Um, phone to show. <clears throat> I really, if at all possible, want this to be you guys. Number one, I want you to have control over your listing and know who's gonna show the property. Number two, hopefully you'll sell this property, but if your listing expires and you put your client's phone number for phone to show in there, guess what? 2,400 agents now have your client's phone number and they're gonna be calling them over and over. So I prefer to try to keep my client's information out of this if at all possible. Showing instructions, you know, do we need an extra hour ahead of time? And when you have those day sleepers or those dog issues or those kinds of things, I put it here in showing instructions and I also put it in agent only remarks just to make sure the agent is paying attention to what I've said. So whatever those showing instructions are, put that in there. You guys are gonna be an exclusive right to sell. You can be an exclusive agency. I prefer you not to be because exclusive right to sell says you guys are gonna get paid no matter how the house is sold. Exclusive agency says they can sell the house at a garage sale and they don't have to pay you. So yeah, I'd rather you be exclusive right to sell because you're covered. Subdivision, if I had the CRS pulled up, I would come up here and I'd click on CRS and get the subdivision and just come in and check it off because it's actually Merriman's right there. But cross street, if there's a close cross street, I would encourage you to go ahead and put that in there. You can see that the tax data has already been populated as has the legal description. I want you to come right here and make sure that says, even though it's not pink, I wish this one were pink because I want to make sure you guys are putting where you got that information. Where did I get the um, tax, tax numbers from the assessor. So if they're wrong, it's on the assessor. It's not on you. Okay. Legal description. Just make sure that it looks the, exactly the same as the one in, um, CRS. And if it doesn't populate truly, what I do is I go into the CRS data and I highlight it and I copy it and I bring it over here and I paste it. So I don't inadvertently change a number because I can tell you for sure that lot 136 is different than lot 135. And if you're trying to sell the property, it does make a difference. Owner name has been automatically populated for you. Same thing here with owner phone. I prefer not to give that out if I don't have to. Who's living in it or is it vacant or whatever the case may be? How many stories is it that does not populate from MLS or from CRS? All right, these next three lines are perhaps three of the most important because a lot of people will look at a house based strictly on these three blanks. Where are my kids going to school? Okay, so make sure that this is accurate. Nearly every district, I think in the area now has a, an interactive map on their website. So you can go to like Springfield or SPS.org and you can go to the district lines and you can actually see a map with all of the schools mapped out and where they actually lay. I encourage you to do that versus certainly don't use an old listing because boundary lines do change. But if you've got a house across the street, a house next door and a house two houses down for sale and they all have the same schools, I'm gonna feel pretty comfortable with that. But I would rather you guys go check to make sure, um, just to make sure that we're, not, we're representing the property as well as we can. 
how many bedrooms and baths um square footage this this particular one only populated one floor and this is a multiple floor house for whatever reason it didn't pull all that so that's we got a thousand here we've got i don't know what it was here anyway so you just make sure that that is correct and if you don't have um if I lost my train of thought there. Um, hopefully you can put assessor where we got our square footage from. I would rather be from an assessor or from a previous appraisal. I don't want you guys measuring the house yourself. And if you do, or if your client has a measurement that's different from the tax record, that's okay. I would, in that case, I want you to leave the square foot provided by blank and make sure that we put buyers to do their own due diligence on square footage. Okay. Approximate year built. Do we have a garage, yes or no? Do we have carport? How many stalls do we have? Is there a carport? And if you click yes, it's gonna give you that extra blank for that. Lot size provided by A-S-S-E-S-S-O-R. Cause it's already populated from CRS data right here. Is there a basement? Is there a waterfront view? Marketing remarks. Another reason I like to have paper with me when I go to the client is because that way when they gush about something about their property, I can take a note of that because the things that they love about their property are likely going to be the things that are going to make someone else want to move into the property. Man, I'm going to miss this kitchen window because the birds are always out here eating out of this hummingbird feeder every morning. You know, great views. What, whatever that equates to, I like to make those notes. You've got 2,000 characters available. I encourage you, I don't want you to put a bunch of fluff in there but I encourage you to put as much information as you can. Because if you look at, at, if you'll scroll through the MLS someday, you'll see listings that have, you know, a one line, great house and quiet neighborhood. And no real detail as far as the rooms or anything goes. And the listing's like half a page long. And then you'll come across another one with this great expansive detail and the marketing remarks and all of the things filled out below and it's a page and a half. That is a better representation for your client it's gonna keep people on your site longer. It's gonna keep people looking at your house longer. And to me, again, my client's hiring me, so why am I not gonna do the best job I can for them? So I encourage you to put as much in there as you can. Agent only remarks, like I said, if I've got specific showing instructions, if I'm concerned about square footage, I like to put those and reiterate those in the agent only remarks. Directions. I want you to write down your directions and then I want you to get up and go do something else for 30 minutes. And then I want you to come back to your desk. I want you to grab your imaginary steering wheel and I want you to read your directions and make sure it actually gets you to the property. Because from experience, I can tell you it's a big difference when you write right instead of left, north instead of south and east instead of west. So just make sure that when you do that, that you're actually getting to the property. And another thing to consider is the shortest distance between two points is a straight line it's not always the prettiest. So if perhaps taking your client maybe around the block might take them by that gorgeous park instead of by that industrial zone, I'm gonna tell you to take them around the block because we want them to have a good feeling driving up to the property. And if we have to take them a little out of their way to do that, I would encourage you to do that. It's gonna automatically populate for active. If you wanna do coming soon, you can. Um, you can do coming soon up to 14 days ahead of time. Nobody can show it. You can't show it, but you can at least have it on the MLS. So people can see it. Office remarks. I have never utilized this box in 20 years. So I would tell you that that's what the internal book face page is for. If you need something for our um, internal wise, because that's, that only goes to our particular agents. Listing broker is a designated agent. And here's the commissions that I talked about a little while ago that in on our employment agreement it goes sub agent buyer's agent and then transaction and this one goes buyer's agent sub agent so based on what we did earlier ours would look like this okay and that's what's going to be published on the MLS. So when somebody prints out their MLS, it's going to show, you know, that we are offering 3% commission to any buyer's agent or sub agent or transaction broker that brings us a ready, willing and able buyer that we can close the property with. How are we going to show it? Whatever you and your client have determined at that point. 
Again, I would prefer it not be calling your agent. What kind of lockbox are we going to have? Hopefully you have a super on there. If you have to have a combination lockbox on there, do not, I repeat, do not put the code out to public because the great thing about our super boxes is I get notified every time it's open. The thing about a combination box, I don't have a clue, but I want to know every person that has that combination. So if there is a combination lockbox on it, I want you to call me first so I know I've given the number out to you, okay? Most often you're gonna have a super and it's not gonna matter. Is there any view? Do we have any special accessibility things that we wanna point out? I'm gonna go through this next part fairly quick, guys, because it's just the detail stuff. Is the basement, where's the utility room? If it is on the main floor, certainly check that. Now, you may not want to necessarily advertise that it's on in the basement or out in the garage, but the utility room being on the main floor is a big deal for a lot of people. Dining and what kind of dining do we have? Is there an attic? I don't expect you guys to walk up you know, the attic stairs and look in the attic. Take your seller's word for it. Is it floored? Is it insulated? How long ago did you do the insulation? Those kinds of things, just so we know, you know what to advertise. And when in doubt, it's not in pink, so you can leave it blank. Do we have any additional rooms that we need to talk about? What appliances are staying with the property? This is another big thing to consider both in your listing as well as your photography. If your client has a gorgeous six spider burner Viking stove that they are planning to take with them to their new house, A, kind of like I mentioned earlier, I would rather that already be replaced before we show the property, if at all possible. But B, if it's not able to be replaced before then, then I don't want to advertise that the stove is staying. I want to make a note in the agent only remarks that the Viking stove is not staying, but will be replaced. And I don't really want to put it in my pictures. Because if I put it in my pictures, I'm kind of representing that it goes with the property. Same thing about sheds in the backyard. Don't take a picture of it if it's not staying with the house, okay? But just make sure whatever you check here is actually going with the property. Do we have any additional equipment? Do we have a fireplace? If so, where is it? And um, make sure the location's down there. So do we have one? If we have yes, then it's gonna give us extra things that we can check off as to where it is. Interior features, this is what I talked about why I have that list with me because I can go through and just click these, check these boxes off as I go. Same thing with flooring, cooling and heating. I prefer to go with my own two eyes and look in the furnace room because you would be amazed the number of people that don't honestly know if they have electric or gas furnace or water heater. I don't know. I just pay the bill. Water gets hot. House stays cold. So I like to go look at those things just to make sure. Um, same thing about when we get down to um, the uh, septic system. Go get your utility bill for me. I want to make sure that you're actually paying a sewage fee. Because if you're not, you may not be hooked up to the sewer. And there again, you would be, you will be surprised. You will come across houses that you would have thought for sure were connected. My house is connected on my side of the street. The other side of the street is not. All those houses are still on septic tanks. And you wouldn't, it's not out in the rural area. It's not something you would think. So just make sure that they're actually paying a sewage fee. But what kind of heating do we have? If you were going to check anything as far as this um, energy efficiency goes, I really like to have copies of the manuals. So if we've got a, you know, a green water heater, I would like to have the manual for that water heater that we can pass along to show that it actually is that energy efficient. Architecture, you can check all of these items if you want to. If you don't know, this is how you learn. Go to the MLS and find properties that resemble the one that you're getting ready to sell and see what they describe as the architecture. Also, guess what? It's not in pink. So you don't have to fill it out if you don't know. If you're questioning what the actual architecture is, you can leave that alone. Often you're gonna run into the, you know, the ranch or the patio home or contemporary, but when in doubt, go do some research on the MLS. Do we have any patch or uh, patio or porches? Do we have a pool? What kind of exterior stuff do we have going on? Other structures, again, if we check these, make sure they're actually staying with the property. What kind of parking do we have? You've gotta have at least one of these selected now. This is a new thing. You have you can't just leave it blank. Let me change it up here too. 
yeah, you may have to check one for the architecture now because this they just altered the MLS and this red red line is new. So I think now you have to check at least one. Parking features, do we have any outbuildings? Fencing, if it's chain linked on one side, barbed wire in the back and wood on the other side, check all three. Um, it's whatever, if there is it. And hopefully your client will know whether or not they own the fencing. It's just, a, you don't necessarily have to know that, but it's just a nice thing to know. If typically the good side faces out. So if you see a privacy fence and the, the quote, you know, I don't want to call it the bad side, but the construction sites on the inside, odds are it goes with the property. Same thing with chain link. If the bar is on the side of the property, odds are it belongs to that property. Odds are. Now, I personally, when I built my fence, I didn't want to look at the bad side. So two of my bad sides are actually facing the other direction. So it's not always, it's not a for sure, but usually you can determine that. Um, what kind of windows do we have? Exterior construction materials, foundation, roofing material, any lot things. Cul-de-sac is a big deal for people because they know that it's going to be less traffic. So if you've got a cul-de-sac, certainly, you know, put that in there. Any views that you've got, golf course, any of that stuff, certainly check. <clears throat> Here's the water. Make sure that we're actually paying for city water and make sure that we're paying a sewer assessment. Because if not, then we need to do some more investigation and figure out where the water is coming from or where it's going. What kind of road frontage do we have, surfaces? If there is an association, what does it include? What goes with it? For whatever reason, the association info is down here. So is there an HOA or condo administration? If so, how much are we paying? Nope, oh, hopefully not five grand. And that's a yearly. And if you've got the contact information, that's great to put in there. Uh, if there's any kind of boat slip or anything that goes with it, if we have any easements of other things going on through this situation. So if we've got, we can't have a mobile home on it or we are in a floodplain, if you know any of these things, certainly check that. If you don't, that's fine. You don't have to put it in there. How do they, how do they care to sell it? You can check whatever goes off here. I mean, if they want to do cash or, con or conventional, just keep in mind, and I like to have this conversation with my clients at this point, if we say that we're willing to go FHA or VA or USDA, the lender may have requirements of things that need to be done to the house that the buyer may not request in their inspection notice. So there may be additional things that we have to deal with because of the lending situation. And usually it's not much. And most often the items are covered in the inspection notice, but I like to have that conversation right now. So when it comes up later, it's not a huge shock or surprise to them. Flood insurance, if you don't know, I encourage you to go ahead and check status unknown. I think that's a good liability reducer for you guys that, hey, I don't know what the status is. If you want to know, you better go check it. Possession, please, please, please be at closing. Possession prior and possession after, you will call me because there will be problems. I'll just go ahead and tell you. So try to get it at closing if you can. You can attach any documents that you have. We're obviously going to attach the seller's disclosure and we'll assume on this one, um, well, where's the lead paint? There it is. So we'll do the lead paint. But if I've got a you know, measurement disclaimer or if I happen to have a recent radon report, whatever it is, you can attach all these on here. At the very least, like I said, we have to have seller's disclosure statement for every property. And if it's pre-78, they all have to have a lead-based paint. Warranty type, hopefully it's going to be furnished by seller. And what kind of financing are you willing to do? Again, cash, conventional, and if we do that FHA or VA or the USDA, there may be additional expenses for us. Rooms, if you don't own a electronic room measuring device, go spend the 20 or 30 bucks or whatever it is. A little bit smaller than your cell phone, you can put it up against the wall like this, you can press a button, it shoots a beam across the room and it will tell me that this room is 26 feet long. And I can go over here and it'll shoot a beam across here and tell me that it's 15 feet that way. So while I'm walking through the property with the client and my clipboard with paper on it, we can go through and they can be telling me the great thing about this room, bang, and I'm measuring it at the same time. Because this again, I think it makes your property show better with more information and your room sizes. But the other thing to me that it does is it might eliminate a buyer coming through that wasn't going to buy the property anyway. So if I've got a buyer that has massive master bedroom furniture, that they have to have a 20 by 
30 foot master bedroom to fit and they see that mine's only 16 by 12. Yeah, have I missed out on a buyer? Probably not because they weren't going to buy the house anyway. So I've saved them time and I've saved me time. But you can put, you can get your rooms in here and do whatever you need to do with it. What levels it on? Yeah, I, I generally do the big part of it. So like if, if I was doing this room here, I would probably go from the half wall over because I don't want to represent that the whole room is that wide when it's really not. But I can certainly say, well, you have at least this much space that you can fully, fully utilize. Yeah, you can because you've got a space right here that you can make those remarks if you choose to do so underneath the room that, you know, buyer to do their own diligence. You can write that on every one of them if you want to. Um, and these aren't going to be, I don't see this, somebody holding this against us. I'll put it to you that way. I don't see this as a potential litigation thing. This is just us providing more information about the property. Okay. And you'll be pretty accurate if you get one of those laser laser measurers. You can do it with a tape measure too, but it's just so much faster just to be able to walk through and, and beep it. And you can add as many rooms on here as you need to. And then how are we going to distribute this? As of right now, it's going to all of these sites and as well as our KWLS, which puts it out to like 700 other sites. If you have a seller that says, I don't want my property on that Zillow, well, guess what? We can come right over here and we can take them right off that Zillow. Okay. So I generally have the conversation that I don't like Zillow either, but it's fantastic exposure. So why wouldn't we want your house everywhere we can possibly put it? Okay. And then once you've got everything pink filled out, and since I don't, when I click this, it's gonna tell me, see, I've got errors that be found, and those errors are gonna be pink areas that I have not filled out yet. It will not let me submit it until everything is done. So at this point, I would just come back here and say, yep, and it's actually telling me, you are, yeah, because I've got to enter a phone number, et cetera. Photos, this is where you just come and just a general, you know, you're just going to browse on your computer and figure out where they are and then upload them. And it will allow you to make comments underneath them. Same thing with your documents. You come in here and you're going to put what kind of, you know, seller's disclosure. You're going to go search for it on your computer and just add it to it. And this is, like I said, if, if you've got a survey, go ahead and put it out there. Why wouldn't you? You're going to have to provide that as the seller anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and give that information out. So any documents you have, you can put on there. All right, in addition to the employment agreement, you guys are also going to need our affiliated vendor disclosure that says that we have a affiliated relationship with these clients. Um, you will need, like I said, the home warranty, and you have to have either a home warranty application or a home warranty waiver on every property, buyer or seller. And what I will tell you as a motivating factor for you guys to get the home warranty put on the property is if there is a claim on that property, litigation wise that has to go through our ENO. If you have an active home warranty on the property, you don't have to pay your deductible. Deductible is five grand. You will pay 70% of that. So you're paying 3,500 bucks. So to me, it's worth trying to push that home warranty, but either way, you've got to have either an application or a waiver on every property. Um, I think that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would do the builders and I would just attach the builder's warranty with it. I think that we still have to have that for compliance. That's odd. I've never been asked that question before. So the builder warranty may carry that through, but that would be a great question to ask Nicole. I will try to remember to ask her that compliance wise, you know, wise, if that covers us or not. Yeah. I can't believe I've never been asked that question. Okay. All right. What questions does anybody have online or in person? Yeah, I just had a, another quick question. Um, the affiliated vendor uh, form that you fill out, what do you guys, uh, what different vendors do you guys use? Or what would you guys fill out that form for? Uh, the affiliated vendor says that those people have essentially given us money and that we have a relationship with them, but that we are not getting, quote, kickbacks from them. But we have to disclose that relationship because if they purchase, you know, like, um, let's say Buddy's Carpet Care, 
if we refer our client to Buddy's Carpet Care and for whatever reason there's an issue or whatnot, we have to disclose the fact that we have a relationship with them before that happens. And the fact that they are you know, part of our vendor program. Okay, so, so can, it, it's already filled out for you with all of the vendors on it. So all you have to do is just get it signed. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yep. Thank you. You bet. All right, I need to. I have a very amateur question. Gotcha. Is the basement considered a story? No. So the stories are from ground level up, okay. and then you'll have a chance to because you have a special section for basement actually in the listing where you can put that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Question was, is a, is a basement considered a story and or a bonus room? The basement would be um, not considered and the bonus room would be because it's it's part of it. So share it. Any other questions, Jared and Natalia? Uh, no, I'm good. I'm good. I appreciate it. Great yeah. class. class. And, and I am. Um, I think it's next Thursday I'm doing buyers. Let's just look what we're all here. Yep, I'm doing buyer's documents next Thursday. So we'll go through the buyer's employment agreement, which looks a lot like the one we did today, as well as I'll go through an entire contract and we'll make an offer, okay? So if you guys got any questions for me, and I think I've got both of you in my phone, Jared and Natalia, if not, text me your numbers, 417-827-6275. Uh, and if you guys got questions this week, call me. That's all I got for you today. Awesome, thank you, Don. You have a good day. All right, well, let's just go look. Say again what we're looking for here. So I was presenting a backup contract and it says that the property has to be submitted with it. And they didn't do that. So now I'm going to have to submit and say, hey, we got to do this work. The backup item. Yeah. 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 There's that one, but there's another one too. It looks different. To me, this one will be the one if, if we decided to go with the backup. Mm -hmm. Copy the fully executed release. The prior contract is attached. Buyer no longer has the right to terminate this contract. That's if, yeah, that's if I'm bringing them back in. Mm -hmm. uh, but like on the, you know, the back page of the offer, there it says. This looks like the one that you want right here. Okay, that's the one I have. Okay. Yeah, because it, it discusses the time frames of the paragraph, because that's the main thing I wanted to see is make sure you guys didn't have to do inspections or any of that other stuff, because it's it does not have those time frames until the notice is given with the form that we looked at to begin with. Right. So, so this the that's the one that needs to go with the contract. Yeah, because it, it puts everybody on the same page that you are in second position. So right. until that such point. So since they sent it to me, can I just send this back? with our stuff and say, hey, you guys need to fill this out? I would, yeah. I would, I would. Perfect. All right. Excellent. Well, that's all I got, guys. If you need something, if you got questions, I'm still here, but that's all I got for you. Appreciate it. You betcha. All right. Who's Paige and who's Ashley? Paige. Paige and Ashley? Okay. Perfect. Nice to, nice to meet you as well. Are you guys transferred from elsewhere? Are you brand new? Excellent. You're going on a team? Independent? Perfect. Okay. Great. And are, are your licenses here yet? Excellent. She sold eight well, I don't know. She asked me that the other day. It's because I've gotten the buyer and the seller side off. My husband is a builder. Oh, okay. So, Excellent. Uh, my boyfriend buys and sells the house. Let's say if you, get, if you got built ins, those are always nice. I like that. I do have a question because as I was sitting here, I got to say, I'd like to. Um, I did 
did just have a, a property that was off market. Somebody I've met with before that was possibly wanting to sell. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I got her property um, under contract because I had an agent reach out to me about building a custom for somebody. But when they were describing the home, they were describing this lady's house. So mm -hmm. I thought, anyway, it got it under contract. Um, but um, she just messaged me just now and sent me a link to Zillow, which shows her address before it was even finished. And then she said, wow, I just saw this. I guess they did get a good buy because it's listing her, her the Zestimate is 331, which would put her house at 161 a square foot. And, Whoa. She got an amazing, and she got an amazing buy. It's a cash offer. She got me an amazing deal on this house. Like, I'm just like, thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. that it's like, it happened perfect. But I don't know how to respond because I've gotten several negative comments like that. Um, and I'm just not even so sure like how much she's paying fees for realtor to other agent and her. Yeah. Um, and I also gave her a, a price break, which I know, I know. But the reason why is because she was possibly wanting us to build her a house later right. on. So I, she already contacted me today even about purchasing a lot. So I don't mind doing that. I didn't have to list it. I'm good with that. Um, but then she just continues to talk about the commission that's being paid. And I've tried to explain like, hey, this other agent, like we wouldn't be selling the house if she hadn't that's right. brought the fire. And, and that's exactly the way I would explain it is we have, I am a realtor. This is my job. I, I'm not doing this for fun. This is actually how I feed my family. Right. And guess what? That's how the buyer's agent feeds their family too. So in order for that to happen, we've got to be, I'm like, Hi. time I took a stand. <laughs> oh, you're just terrible. But yeah, that's, and that's exactly what I would say is we, we've got to offer that to the other one. I'm taking a reduction because I'm trying to give I you a break. I told her like how much I've saved. I'm like, well, how much is how much I've, I've saved you by doing this? Mm -hmm. and saying, I'm not trying to make it wrong to me. But um, what would you specifically say about this whole estimate? Um, well, information the information on there is even clear. Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. yes. Do you see the contract changes, especially the thing about earnest money? No. Okay, earnest money changed on the contract. Um, you have to look through it. There's a red letter edition of it, but there's no signature anymore. And in it, it now says you have five days to get the earnest money in. If it any time before it comes in, the seller can terminate the contract. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Wow. No, I didn't know that. I found out two days ago, yesterday. I don't know. Well, and again, like Jim said, it's one of those things we talked about in our broker meetings for six months, and apparently it happened and nobody told us. Yep. Right in the middle of yeah, right when we're we're not going to be able to pay attention to it. But as far as the Zestimate goes, I would just I would truly just say that that's why my broker hates Zillow because the act the likelihood that it's accurate is very slim. The information it even has on there is incorrect. It says it's only a one bathroom, which I don't even want to bring that up for sure. One bathroom, mine's two, or you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh. The only, I mean, the, to me, the best, the best way to do that, if you want to take the time, is to go comp the neighborhood and show her exactly what. She got an offer that's better than comp. Like, so, I mean, anyway, so I guess it's just, it's, it's something I can. No, and it's really not. The Zillow, yeah. yeah, the Zillow thing is something that we're just going to have to learn how to fight because it's, the, the general public population does not understand how off that actually is. Now, in major metros, it probably is a little bit closer, but here, they again, we're non-disclosure. They're pulling whatever information they can from the MLS, and that's the only place they're getting it. So, yeah, that should be fairly accurate, but there's estimate stuff. I've ne I've never seen one that's close. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we look for new construction, we'll see around by having problems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. I'll tell her that as well. Well, and you know, have her go look up friend's houses or some of those others and she'll realize that it's not just hers it's everybody's is off yeah i mean that's if they if they're all about zillow then i just send them back to zillow and say okay well go look up x y and z and right. see see how you feel about it then right okay i guess and i just feel frustrated mm -hmm. well, i feel like she should be grateful that that's not going to help you with no <laughs> Is there anything that I need to be aware of? I've never had one, so I don't like. No, it's truly really just in second position. So, 
until such point that the first one goes south, you just kind of leave that on the back burner and just, you know that it's there. And essentially they have first right of refusal if the first one falls through. Otherwise, nope. But they put like weird timelines in there that would not be met because it, it won't line up. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like they want to close on the 8th of February if it falls apart, but by the time we're through inspection, there's no way we would have that deadline. You get that done, right? Yeah. yeah, and I wouldn't worry about that because if if the first one does fall apart, I would encourage you just to do a contract amendment with, you know, all the new details. All the new details. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. 